commercial department, so I don't know enough about yield management. Um, it's certainly not for me to define the train reliability strategy, because I don't know enough about train reliability or engineering. It's for me to see if they are aligned to each other, and together we'll deliver our sharehold, what our shareholders are looking for, i.e. safety and profit. And as importantly, the question I did ask them is saying, what is the support you need from me to make these happen? I guess the, the question I would ask is, how effective can it, re effective can it really be in any organisation when the CEO and his team come up with a list of goals and objectives and then cascade or roll them out to their direct reports, who in turn do the same to their direct reports, so you get the picture. Imagine how powerful and empowering it is for everyone in the company to have developed and created their own vision for the company and then be given the freedom to deliver it. In fact, I guess what I'm arguing is to reverse the traditional process in a business. Have the frontline teams develop their goals and objectives first, based on their vision, then it becomes our job to make sure they're aligned across the business. And that's exactly what Sir Richard did with me. He gave me the goals and objectives. He said, make money. And that was it. But understanding the business, clearly the non-negotiable in that is you have to be safe. So it was simple. Mine was to be safe and make money. So the, what we did with the business over a period of time is we built the goals and objectives up from the bottom, if you like, or from the front line. And then our job as executives and leaders was to align those goals and objectives across the business to deliver the ultimate, which is make money. So we have leaders who listen and we have leaders who have a shared vision. But here's tip three. If you haven't got the passion, by the way, it's not me at the bottom putting the lippy on, just a <laughs> nice to add. Um, if you haven't got people in the organisation with, who haven't got the passion, who have, haven't got the passion for what you're trying to do, um, it's going to be a problem. So whatever your position in the organisation, tip three is always assemble a great team that have that passion. And as Richard has been said, said um, the best CEOs are not concerned with the size of their office or thickness of the carpet, but instead they have a passion for unearthing what their employees are thinking and feeling. Another saying which I often use is a good leader locks their ego away in the desk drawer. Egos, in my experience, can be hugely damaging and dangerous. I have in my very small office in Birmingham an old British Rail policy on office carpet. Your management grade determined how close your carpet could be to the skirting boards. You were somebody very, very special if you had a fitted carpet. So we look for people who love the product we're trying to deliver. People who have a passion for providing fantastic customer service. Our recruitment team have completely reshaped our recruitment policy over the, over the years and have a very simple approach. We recruit for attitude first and experience second. You can train people, you can give people experience. It's bloody difficult to give them the right attitude. So we approach our recruitment to, to recruit for the attitude first and then we'll work with them to develop the experience. As I say, you can design the very best processes, the very best business plans, and have the very best equipment. But this will all come to nothing if you do not have enthusiastic and passionate staff. I remember an incident to illustrate this very clearly. Um, it was, it's actually, it actually was a similar night to this at Wolverhampton Station. Um, very wet, windy. There was an old elderly lady who was trying to alight from our train, and a passenger knocked her onto the platform. She fell onto the platform. Fortunately, she wasn't that badly hurt, but understandably, she was very shaken up. One of our platform team, who had just finished a 10-hour shift for the day, stepped in. He stayed with the lady and waited for the paramedics to arrive. He then followed the ambulance to the hospital, stayed with the lady until her husband had arrived, and then he organised a taxi to get them home. He then checked so that she was okay a few days later. 
He didn't have to do this. He wasn't asked to do it, but he felt passionately it's what we are about when we look after the customer. You can't recruit. You can't train that into people. They either have it or they don't. And what's remarkable about our experience, I mentioned the problems we had with the brand initially, putting the Virgin brand onto a side of a, a British Rail train and raising an expectation and not delivering that expectation for several years. What is remarkable about our experience in trains is how the same people who delivered the service under British Rail and were seen to be largely cold and disinterested towards the passenger are the very same people who are now delivering industry-leading customer service. So the passion was always there. It had been suppressed, devalued, destroyed by a command and control structure driven by process, status and, quite frankly, fear. All we had to do was release it. So, in came tip one, listen. Followed by tip two, have a vision. From these, we identified enormous amount of passionate people who were driven to deliver fantastic customer service. Tip three. So the final tip, and remember, you're getting all this free of charge, is how do we harness that passion and support the people to deliver their vision? Tip four, screw it, let's do it. And this is actually um, um, a phrase Sir Richard uses very regularly. I've already said we found many, many passionate and committed people hiding under a mass of rules and regulations, commands and control systems. So the challenge for us was how do we release this energy for the good of the business? So... Screw it, let's do it. And so this is a motto Richard and the Virgin businesses have used for many, many years. And to succeed as a business leader, you must have the bravery to give it a go. If you like, the resolve and the conviction to overcome the hurdles and give people confidence to follow you. And that's one thing which you see in most, in fact, all of the Virgin businesses. There is that passion and that bravery to do things differently. And I think you know, if you look at Virgin Trains, before Virgin Trains, all of the Virgin companies were the classic startups, such as Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Records. So the people in these businesses grew up with, the, with, those, with those businesses, starting with one or two individuals and becoming what, are, what they are today, or some of them actually went down to business. So screw it, let's do it was a natural ent entrepreneurial trait. As I said earlier, Virgin Trains was the first established business to be given the brand. And certainly, it did create major headaches in the early years. There is one story which I think is true. Um, to paint them in that grotty red colour, if people can remember that, some of the trains, the paint was still wet when we started the service. Um, it was done in such a rush and they banged the Virgin brand on the side and everybody had some nice new uniforms with the Virgin branding on. As I said, that put an expectation in the, in the customer's mind straight away. So putting a brand associated with great customer service and fun, and which reveled in being different, onto a product associated with a state-run business and with over 100 years of tradition was an interesting challenge. Um, and I guess I could take up another lecture on its own. But it harmed the brand. It really damaged the brand in those early years. I said earlier, Virgin Atlantic was scoring plus 14, Virgin Trains were scoring very quickly minus 14. That's a hell of a difference, as I'm told, in brand ratings. Um, so suffice it to say, the early years, the brand did suffer major damage um, and devaluation as a result of raising that expectation and not being able to deliver. And I think it's interesting to note, Virgin had, have learned from that lesson. Um, they've acquired Asura Medical um, and now they are winning lots of uh, contracts to provide medical services to various health authorities but they don't put the Virgin brand on it until they're happy it is a Virgin business because they don't want to take that brand hit again. So they have learnt from, um, from the experience. And I think it's fair to say um, the problems we had in the early years were many. Expectations had risen, as I've said. 
we could not de 